everybody. God praise. Glad to see you. Have a seat for just a second. They're going to continue worship in just a moment, but a couple of things I want to walk you through real quick. First of all, we're just excited that you're here today or watching online and uh, pray that God speaks to us today about our failures and being honest with him about those. And uh, a couple of things I want to make mention of. One, you should have got a program as you came in. If you didn't, if you slipped past our greeters, if you'll raise your hand, they'll grab you uh, a bulletin and bring it to you in just a second. And then uh, also in there, there's some great information about some things happening at Crossroads. So check those out. There's a connection card in there. And we would just ask you to fill that out. And then at the end of the service, drop those in the offering baskets on the way out uh, today. And uh, before I get to the next announcement, I want to ask if you'll go ahead and pull out your cell phone. I'm going to give you 
permission. Usually you have to sneak and hide it when you're checking out things, but go ahead and pull that out and open your texting app here in just a second. Before we get to that announcement, I'm going to tell you uh, a few weeks back, we uh, introduced the new budget for our fiscal year and uh, it's been sitting out. We've talked through it a few times. Uh, today we need to vote on that. And so if you're a member, you've been to our Connect Our Family class and have joined our church, then we just need to vote on the budget. And so uh, those of you that are in favor of, as members of approving our next fiscal year budget, please uh, raise your hand. Beautiful. And anyone opposed to the new budget? Beautiful. Okay, thank you. It is approved then. And uh, last thing I want to mention before we get back to worship is in your cell phone, uh, I want you to go to your texting app and pull up the slide there. We have a new uh, giving platform. Our previous one was a little difficult to get into and use. Now you can have a link right to our new Push Pay Giving app. And uh, you can text yourself Crossroads JC, just that word, Crossroads JC, to that I'm, uh, to the number 77977, and that link will show up on your phone, and you can um, use that link uh, for giving. This is a precursor to an app we're going to have. We'll, Crossroads will have, we'll have our own app with all kinds of functionality in just a month or two, but this is a good Band-Aid until then. Guys, thanks for being here. We're excited about lifting up our Savior. Please stand again, and we'll get back to worship.
set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. So set a fire down in my soul that I can contain. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. what's important. We don't give you no medal for trying. I know that. I know they don't. And it's nice to win something. It's real nice to win something.
but it's more important to know how not to win something. I know how to do that real good. No, you don't. You mean there's more things I could have not won? I mean you could have been a nice loser. They call it sportsmanship. Now, you, you lost this time. You try again next time. You got to learn how to take disappointment. There could be more of them coming up, you know. You come up smiling, you're a good loser. The other way is being a bad loser. Now, what do you want to be? A good winner. Opie, we're not talking about winners. Winning ain't no problem. It don't take courage to be a winner. It does take courage to be a good loser. Now, you want to be a good loser? You'll be proud of your friends that did win, and you'll congratulate them for it. I won't. You won't? They ain't my friends. They beat me, and they got my medal. Is that the way you feel about it? Is that the way you feel about it? Answer me. Fine. Fine. That's the way you want to be, as long as we understand one another. But I want you to know one thing. I'm disappointed in you. Good morning, church. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Corey Sargent. I'm on staff here at Crossroads. And for those of you who are really young, that's Andy Griffith. Um, people in my generation grew up watching that. And that episode is actually where Opie tries to win a medal. He's in the 50-yard dash. He wants to win a medal, but he fails. And he not only fails, he fails bad. He comes in dead last. Today, we're talking about failure. And Andy, what he said is so right, though, at the end of that or in the middle of that, he says it doesn't take courage to be a winner. And if we're honest with ourselves, we fail a lot. Sometimes we fail in our sin, conquering it. Sometimes we fail in our marriages. Sometimes we fail with our children. Sometimes if you're a student, maybe you fail in a grade or maybe a subject or, or maybe even you've failed in sports, failed in a team or getting on the team. Failure is a part of our lives. So the question today is, why do we fail? Why do we fall? And looking at life, it, it's, it's obvious. It's everywhere. And what I want to do is I want to think about, I want you to think about each person in here. Think about one area that you've either, either failed or are failing right now. And I want you to think as we go through this message, I, I want you to think of how we can handle that, how we can deal with it. A few weeks ago, I was listening to a sermon, and the preacher said this. He said that when we go through something difficult, we need to, to have something to lean into. We need to have something that we can focus on, a truth. So what he said was this. He says, we really need to focus on things that we understand to help us when we have things we don't understand. We need to help us with things that we can understand to help us when we go through things we don't understand. And the failure that you thought about, Normally, that's a failure is something that we don't understand why God is allowing us to do it, why God is allowing us to go through it. So in helping and focus on the thing that we can understand, what we've done is we've created the Christian cheat sheet. And what it is, if it's, it's in your bulletin, if you would pull it out. And it's basically one thing that we a list of things we can understand when we fail, when we go through something that we don't understand. You know, sometimes we have situations in life that, that get thrown our way, like cancer, um, depression, um, divorce, failure in our jobs, failure in some sort of other health thing. And this cheat sheet is really kind of a way that you can use it as a bookmark as you're going through Scripture, help you when you're reading Scripture, something you may not understand, or just some life situation. You can pin it on your bulletin board if people still have those today. Um, and kind of just look at it and, and help you to get through those situations. So we're going to go through it. The first thing on that cheat sheet says, there is a God. There is a God. And if you're a believer in Christ, our point of truth is the Word of God. 
And in the Word of God, it makes it clear from the beginning, there is a God. It doesn't debate it. It doesn't question it. It doesn't assume that, you know, 5,000 years, 2,000 years, at some point in time, it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a God. It says from Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. There is a God. A matter of fact, Scripture also says this in Psalms 14. It says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So the first thing, when we go through something tough, when we go through something difficult, when we go through a failure, the failure that you have in your minds right now, the first thing we need to do is understand there is a God. The second thing we need to understand is I am not God. <laughs> we are not God. And I heard a wise man put it this way. He said, God has never confused himself with thinking that he is me. And if God has never confused himself for thinking he is me, I should never confuse myself to thinking I am God. We have to understand that there is a God and we're not him. Hebrews uh, eleven six says this. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If we think we're our own God, why would we ever seek after another God? Why would we seek after the real God? We're our God. That's a bad thing. So we need to understand when we go through a life difficult time, when we have some sort of, of situation where we fail, we need to understand there is a God and that we are not him. Number three, God loves me. The word of God is so simple. From Genesis on through the scriptures, it makes it clear that God is love. That God loves us. The gospel is something that God has given us in scripture. And the gospel is itself love. And it starts out kind of bad. It tells us that we messed up. We sinned. But it ends so beautifully. And Jesus knew, God knew, before he created us, before he created any subatomic particle, before he created anything in this world, he knew we were going to mess it up. And so what he did in his divine wisdom is he knew that he had to make a way. He knew that he had to send Jesus to die on the cross for us, to pay for the penalty that we could not pay for our sins. That's the beautiful part of the gospel, is that Jesus and God loves us so much that they died for us. When we're going through something difficult, we need to remember God loves me. We need to remember that God isn't up there, wasn't up there, you know, oh, I'm bored, don't know what to do. Wish I had a friend. God has always been love. He will always be love. And he created us because he wanted to show us love. He created us because he wanted a relationship with us. The fourth thing that we need to understand when we're going through a difficult time. Is that God is sovereign. And sovereignty is just a big church word. That basically means God is in control. And I love, I, told, I said in the first service, I love the, the selection of songs today. Because it talks about how beautifully God takes these bad things and he works them out for our good. God is sovereign. He is in control. We need to understand that he's the one that gives us the good things in our lives. But we need to also understand he's the one who gives us the bad things in our lives. He allows them to happen. God is sovereign. So really... Just to do a recap here. Number one, there is a God. Number two, I'm not him. Number three, God loves me. Number four, God is sovereign. And that leads us to a conclusion. So therefore, if those four things are true, number five, we should do what he tells us to do. We can respond to those first four things in one of three ways. We can dismiss them. We can say they're not true. Or we can go about our lives. Or number two, we can actually say, hey, they're, they're true, but I'm still going to go my own way. Or number three, we can do what God wants us to do. We can accept them, we can embrace them, and we can live them. And when you have whatever is in your head, whether it be a sin that you can't deal with or that you're having a problem dealing with, or whether it be some failure in your life, these four things, and really five things, are the things we need to remember and trust in God. So these, this cheat sheet is kind of a way that when you're dealing with them, it's something you can pull out, you can look at, you can just, just kind of get reaffirmation that, hey, God's in control. He loves me. He's not going to do uh, something that isn't for my best interest. 
And that's why you can trust in these. And we trust in these things when we deal with failure, when we deal with things. And that's the big question today. Why do we fail? Why do we fail? Why do we fall? Because if, if number four is true, if God is sovereign, why does he allow? Why does he allow us to fail? Or even better, if number three is true, if God loves me, well, why would he want me to feel pain? Why, why would he want me to feel rejection or feel, you know, just terrible because of some situation that's happened or some failure that we've gone through? Because the, the, the earthly love would, would say, and each of us that have kids, I hope would agree with this. We don't want our kids to feel some pain that they don't need to feel. We don't want them to feel any pain. But in some God wisdom, he loves us and he is sovereign. So we're going to tackle all these questions today. We're going to start by looking in the Psalms. And we're going to look at a King David Psalm, one that he wrote. It's uh, Psalm 37. And uh, you can follow along in your bulletin or they'll have the words on the screen. Um, but we're looking at Psalm 37 and verses 23 and 24. And it says this. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So let's break down this first voice, or this first verse, sorry. It says, the steps of a good man. The first time I read it, I, I'll be honest with you, the word good there really kind of bothered me. And it made me think of the rich young ruler, the story of the rich young ruler in the Gospels. And if you want to look it up, I encourage you to write down the, the passage. It's Luke chapter 18. And write it down. And sometime this week when you have time, go back and read it for reference. But it's, it's very interesting. A rich young ruler approaches Jesus and he says, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, being Jesus, didn't answer his question immediately. Instead, he asked him a question. He says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. No one is good except for God alone. So in that story, God set the bar. He set the metric of what good is. It is perfection. It is Jesus. So when I read something like this that says a good man, I start to wonder, what, what is, what is uh, King David trying to say here? What is a good man? So let's keep reading help us try to understand it. It says that his steps are ordered by the Lord. His steps are ordered by the Lord. And it dawned on me. If I'm going my own way, if I'm on my own path and I'm taking my own steps. I'm not a good man because I'm not doing what the Lord told me to do. If I'm going my own way, if I'm making my own decisions, if I'm doing what I think is right. I'm not doing what God thinks is right. Instead, I'm supposed to go this way and God's supposed to plant my foot this way on his path. And what this verse is trying to say is, is that if we're on the path, if we're letting God plant our feet, we're good. And the reason is, is because we are not good alone. We need God to be the one who leads us in that direction. And what this is simply saying in a roundabout way is the Christian walk starts with obedience. This is not being obedient, going our way, putting our own steps down. And going and doing what we think is right with our own moral code. That isn't what's obedient. What's obedient is going this way. Going to God's path. Letting him guide our feet. That's what obedience is. So the first point today of why God allows us to fail is because we are not in his will. We're not being obedient. And I want you to think about that sin that you're dealing with. Or think about that failure that you're dealing with. Or one that you just got out of. Think about this. Were you in his will or are you in his will? The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. The Bible makes it so clear. Obedience is better than sacrifice. It doesn't matter how much we come to church. It doesn't matter how much we pray. It doesn't matter how much we read our Bible. It doesn't matter how much we tithe. What matters is obedience. And to bring it home, those of you that have kids... Doesn't it make you feel good when your, your kids will be, obey you? When they, when they, that means they're listening, right? My kids, thankfully enough, are young enough where they still listen. So, obedience. we got to make sure that we're being obedient. Because the hard truth here 
And the reason why that cheat sheet exists is because we've got to understand when we deal with something like failure, we got to know it could be us, that we may not be in his will. And that's a hard biblical truth. The second point of why God may allow us to fail is because he wants to grow our faith and reliance in him. I've heard this phrase, and I hope I don't offend anybody, for a long time. I must really be strong for God to give me what he's given me. Can I tell you that is not biblical? We were created to depend on God. We were created to depend on God. If you're a believer in Christ, we don't have the strength to live the Christian life. We don't have the ability to live the Christian life. We have got to be reliant on him. And it makes me think about how little we, we read, how little we pray, how little we spend time with God. And I go back to the, to the Gospels and I think about what Jesus did. His life. You see, every day he gets alone with the Father. Every day he had some moment where he prayed, where he got alone, where he sought time with the Father. And Jesus himself even said, I can do nothing apart from Christ. I mean, apart from God the Father. I can do nothing. And I think, I think sometimes God thinks we're a little arrogant if we think that we can go through the Christian life without God. If Jesus couldn't do it, we can't do it. We've got to have prayer. We've got to be in the Word. That's what Jesus tried to show us. We can't do it in our own faith, our own strength. We can't do it our own way. It made me think about small groups and families. And looking in our church, there's, there's a lot of successful small groups, a lot of successful families. And a lot of them have something very, very similar, something in common. Every single one of them are, seem, that are successful seem to be going the same way. They seem to be going down, everybody involved are going down the same path. Everybody's not doing their own little thing. Everybody's not going their own way. And those groups that are successful share each other's burdens. Every group that is successful, they do life together. That's what God intended us to do. We were not created to try to live the Christian life alone. We not only need God, we need our groups. We need our families. And I'll put it this way. Let's go back to that thought that you had about a sin that you're dealing with or, or some failure that you've done. And think about this. Think about the day you get up out of bed and you try to do it in your own strength. You're like, God, today I'm not going to do that sin. Whether it be drugs or alcohol or, or, or profanity or whatever it is. God, today I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And what happens? For me, by the end of the day, I've done it, right? I've already done it. I mean, because I'm trying to do it in my own strength. And that's what God's trying to get across to us, that we can't do it in our own strength. And I'll give you another illustration of how we're supposed to handle things like that, sin and failure. I want everybody in here to take a moment, and I want you to not do something. All right? Nobody think about an apple. Nobody think about how juicy and crisp an apple is when you bite into it. Nobody think about an apple pie. Or my favorite apple fritters from Danny's. See, if we're honest with ourselves, every single one of us, and I said this in the first service, somebody's going to stop me and say, I didn't think about it. But every single one of us thought about it. And that's the same way our sin is. That's the same way our failures can be. If we're focused on our sin and we're focused on our failures and we're not focused on God, we're missing it. We're not doing what God's called us to do. We've got to pray. We've got to spend time. And we need to understand that we can't do it in our own strength. The Bible says this. I love this verse. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And this is a principle that is timeless. If we seek God, we're focused on him and everything else just kind of fades away. That's what it talks about. All these things will be added unto you. All 
you focused on God and everything else is just, oh, that's just, that's just nothing. I want God. That's what he wants for us. So the last reason why we may fail is because God wants to build our character. In the opening video, Andy was so right. It does not take much to, to win. It takes a lot more courage to fail. Matter of fact, it's bad to win all the time. And we've been around those people, right? They win all the time. They're annoying. They're arrogant. They're prideful. You know. <laughs> and if we all admit it, we have character flaws. And God knows the worst thing we can do is win all the time. Again, there's a God and I am not. Number one and two on the cheat sheet. We've got to understand that a part of the process of being a believer in Christ is letting him change us, letting him get rid of these bad character flaws and turn us into Jesus. You know, humility is something that happens after a failure. You don't get humility by winning. And our, our, our Lord and Savior was a humble servant. To think that we don't need to be humble is, is, is just ludicrous to me. It's crazy. God is the perfect. Jesus is the perfect example of the kind of life we're supposed to live. God builds on our failures and he turns us into Jesus. Because when he looks down at us, he sees Jesus. That's when we're justified. That's when we accept Christ. But he wants to turn us into Jesus. He wants to turn us into a loving, loving person without the character flaws. So now that we know why God may allow us to fail, I want to focus on something real quick on what we shouldn't do when we fail. The worst thing we can do when we fail is compare ourselves to other people. The worst thing we can do. It's easy to do, but it's the worst thing we can do. And it's even worse if we compare ourselves to a non-believer, if you're a believer in Christ. I want to go back to Psalms 37. I want to look at verses 1 and 2. It says this. It says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of workers of iniquity. For sh they shall soon be cut down like the grass... And wither as the green herb. In that moment where we compare, we compare ourselves to other people, it's easy to do. And that word fret in that, in that verse actually means to get angry. Because that's what we do when we start comparing ourselves to others. We get really, really angry. And this verse is making it real clear. Stop. Stop comparing yourselves to other people. You don't know what they're going through. They don't know what you're going through. You may think that they have a nice, easy life. You know, we, we're in a, a world of celebrities where it looks like they have no, you know, no issues. They have all the money they want. They have all the fame they want. But we need to understand something. Non-believers, this is the best life they're going to have. When we see a non-believer, one day that verse tells us they will be cut down. The little, the little discomfort we feel on this earth because of a failure or some, some, life expect, uh, some life situation like cancer or something we don't understand. It's nothing compared to what they're going to feel for the rest of their lives, for eternity. As a believer, we get the rewards in heaven. We get a relationship with a God who loves us. And we may have a moment of discomfort in this life. But when we see a non-believer, it ought to bring us to tears. One day, they're not going to experience what we get to experience. One day they're not going, they're not going to have the eternal joy and happiness and friendship and love that we have. This is their best life. It ought to bring you to share your faith. It ought to bring you to be friends with whoever is in your life that is not a believer. That's what we're supposed to do when we fail. We're not supposed to compare ourselves. Don't fall into that trap and don't let failures dictate your attitude. Or any part about you. So what I want to talk about now is now that we know how we fail or how God may allow us to fail and what we really, really should not do when we fail. I want to focus on how we can address our failure. I want to focus on just how we can, how we, what we can do, what the Bible tells us to do. And the first thing we're supposed to do is examine ourselves, our sin and repent. Examining ourselves is basically just examining our walk. Where are we with Christ? Are we being obedient? Are we doing what he tells us to do? 
Examining our sin, we, we need to understand that un, unconfessed sin, unrepentant sin, can eat, seep into our lives. It can make us bitter. It can ruin our witness. It can ruin our, our, uh, our, our friendships. It can, it can ruin a lot of things. The worst part, though, is that it can allow evil to enter into our lives. We've got to examine ourselves. Instead of looking outward, we've got to look inward. We've got to look at who we are. We've got to look at, are we on the path? Are we making the steps God wants us to make? Because, again, number one, there is a God. And number two, I'm not him. Secondly, the way we respond to failure is remembering that our identity is in Christ and not in our failures. If you're a believer in Jesus today, you're a child of God. You're a son, you're a daughter, you're a child of God. He loves you. He loved you before he created you. He loved you before he created the world. You're his child. And going back to cheat sheet number three, God is love. God loves me. Christ paid a high price at the cross. The picture of the cross is the epitome of love in this earth, in this life. God loves us so much that he knew we were going to mess it up. He knew that we were, that we were going to fail. He knew that we were going to sin. And he still loved us enough anyway to create us because he wanted a relationship with us. That's how much he loves us. He wants to show us his love. We got to remember our identity is in him. It's not in our culture. It's not in our skin color. It's not in who we marry. It's not what we believe. It's not who our, what our job is. It's not anything of our hobbies or anything else. Our identity as believers is secure in Christ. Your failure does not define you. Don't let it define you and don't let the world think that your failure defines you. The last way we respond to failure is by trusting that God is working together for our good. Romans 8, 28 says this, it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I love this biblical truth. It's so beautiful. We sung about it earlier. God takes the bad things, the bad things we do, the bad situations we get ourselves into, the bad things he allows us to happen. And he makes it into something just beautiful. And I heard a, I heard a preacher do this analogy um, to explain how this works. And he took simple table salt. I mean, who doesn't like salt, right? But it's made up of two components, sodium and chloride. By themselves, they are very harmful chemicals. They're very harmful things. They'll kill you. But when you put them together, they create something beautiful. They make me tolerate mashed potatoes. <laughs> They're wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. It's not even that. It's in addition to that, it, it's, it's a staple of life. It's a part, you, like you can't live this world without salt. It's a component that we got to have. That's what God does. He takes these bad negative things and he takes the good ones and he molds this tapestry together of a beautiful life that looks just like Jesus. That's what, that's what he does for us. So I'm going to close with this. If you're here today and you don't have your identity in Christ, I want to plead with you. Make today the day that you accept him. Make today the day that you follow him. It's easy to put your identity in him, to secure your identity in him. I'm going to go back to number three again, that God loves me. God loves us so much he gave us the gospel. Yeah, it starts off bad. We messed up. We sinned. But it ends so beautifully. He died for us. He came. And he lived a perfect life. To be the sacrifice we needed to pay for our sins. We couldn't earn it. It's not about being good. As we pointed out earlier. Only God is good. And only people who are in the will of God. Are seen as good people by God. It's not about again being baptized, how much you read the word, how much you pray, how much you come to church. It's about a relationship with him. It's about accepting his free gift of salvation. And I'm going to walk you through in a minute just how to do that. But we got to admit we're broken, sinful people. 
In Romans 3.23, it says this. It says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We all have messed up. We all have made mistakes. And the beautiful part is that God made a way for us. The Bible says that the only way to God is through Jesus. There's nothing we have to do to come to him. We don't have to change anything about us. He's going to do the change because as we've seen, we can't do it in our own strength. You want ammunition to change your life to be something better? It's not going to be easy. And it's still going to have bumps and hiccups and, um, and valleys and, and hills that you've got to go through. But the only way to, to equip yourself to get the ammunition to do that is with God, with Jesus. There's nothing you have to do except accept his gift. I want to urge you today, if you don't know who Jesus is, make today the day of your salvation. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to walk you through real simply how you can follow Christ today. How you can make that decision. We need to understand that we are not guaranteed tomorrow. All you got to do is say a simple prayer from your heart to God's. And all a prayer is is just an open dialogue between two friends. Talk to them like you would your spouse or your best friend. And what you want to start with is just confess that Jesus is Lord. You can do that now where you're sitting. Just confess in your heart to God that he is Lord. Now to confess to him that you believe that God raised him from the dead. Ask forgiveness for your sins. Tell him, tell God that you want to repent. And lastly, tell him that you want to start doing things his way and not your way anymore. Now thank him for saving you. And if you made that decision today, please, please come see somebody in our church and uh, leadership, a pastor that can celebrate with you. And today there's another group of people here. A group of people that are dealing with that failure that we talked about in the beginning. I want to urge you to not let your failure define you. Remember that your identity is in Christ. And just follow those five steps, the five cheat sheets or the cheat sheet. Remember that there is a God. You're not him. He loves you. He is sovereign. And because of that, we should do what he needs us to do. Make an effort, make a conscious decision to spend time in prayer and examining your sin and yourself and to make sure that you're in God's will. And lastly, there's some people today here that their identity is secure in Christ and they're not dealing with failure. And maybe for you, the next step is just an act of obedience. Maybe God's calling you to do something, to change something. Maybe to lead somewhere. Maybe to be a part of a small group. I want to encourage you to do that today. Make that decision today to follow him in obedience. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy that you show us. Lord, thank you that you are the God who made a way you are the God who loves us so much that you came and died for us. God, I ask you to be with each person here that's dealing with failure. Lord, help them get through and lean into you. Be with us now as we continue worshiping you. In your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us.
journey's where you are You never want it perfect, you just want it my heart And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good And failure's never final when the father's in the room No failure's never final when the father's in the room on the move when the father's in the room prison doors fling wide the dead come to life love is on the move when the father's in the room miracles take place the cynical fight fades love is breaking through when the father's in the room Have a seat just a second. It is so good to be here in our Father's house where we're reminded today, listen, we are not defined by our failures. We're not. In fact, uh, there's a big difference between saying I've failed and I'm a failure. Saying I'm a failure is, is simply a lie. That is not true. It's a tact of the enemy. What we've learned today is we can say, listen, God, I failed. And in that there is renewing and there is hope and there is life. And so may God bless us as we, as we step into that attitude instead of the other. If you would, pull out your Connect card for a second. I want to just walk you through the responses that we can have to today's message. Uh, one was that if you prayed with, with Corey today and you accepted Christ into your life, man, we want to celebrate that. If you'd check that on the box or if you'll come see me, him, or one of our staff, we want to just rejoice with you in that decision. Uh, secondly, uh, it may be that you've decided to place your identity in Christ instead of something that's been defining you other than him specifically a failure. So if that was the choice you're making today, man, we just want to rejoice in that as well. And then lastly, if there's an area of your life where God is just pressing in towards obedience, and this is an area I really want you to step with me, that we would just, uh, uh, I don't know what that was, but <laughs> Shekinah glory just showed up. Um, but uh, <laughs> but that we would, we would be obedient in that area. Let us know about that as well. Hey, last thing I want to do before we, uh, we dismissed is I'm going to invite, uh, where are they? You guys, come on up. Haley Harrison is getting headed off to boot camp next week. Uh, one of our uh, recently graduated seniors here in our church. And you guys can all come up if you'd like, uh, whoever would like to. We just want to pray over her and ask God's blessing and protection. David said in the Psalm, you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory and the lifter of my head. And so come right out here. You get center stage. Yeah, come on out. And, um, and we're going to pray that, that God would be a shield for you, Haley, that you would watch over your steps, protect your, uh, your person and your unit and and that you would just be safe while you're away, that God would use you for his purposes. She's going in the army, going to be a combat medic. Isn't that good? Give God praise. It's awesome. We're so proud of you. So let's just pray for God's protection of you, okay? Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise. You are God who is a shield. And so, Father, we're thankful for all of our military, but as we, as we see Haley grow up here at our church and now be launched out into a new adventure, we pray for your divine protection over her, God, that you would be this shield 
You would be her strength. You would lift her head. God, you'd be her glory. And Lord, would you go before her? And Lord, use her uh, for your purposes. God, help her to stay on your path on the days ahead. We ask these things in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Yeah, all right. Awesome. Thanks for that. Great day. We'll see you next week. God bless. My soul is healed by the storm.